Okay, so what I would like to do is I would like to start with an introduction to MEG, EEG, and how to analyze EEG and MEG data using the field trip toolbox. I suppose that you all know what field trip is, but I'll just go over it anyway. So field trip is a MATLAB toolbox uh, for the analysis of time series data, uh, not only EEG and MEG, but also intracranial data that was reported in humans, in epilepsy patients, or in animals. And EEG is written such that it can work with data from many different acquisition systems. And what we do with the field trip toolbox is that we provide algorithms for spectral analysis, for source reconstruction, for statistics, for connectivity, and basically everything uh, around it to make our own life as researchers here at the Donners easier. And, and we've, we started sharing a field trip already a long time ago, and it's now a very complete uh, and like widely used toolbox. But it's basically, it's, it's developed, it was developed from our own research needs. What I will do in this lecture, I will, I will basically I deal with like well, how are the, what are the signals, uh, what, what kind of signals are generated in the brain, and how do we record these signals. Then I will move into how, how these signals are being analyzed using FieldTrip. And toward the end of my lecture, I want to explain a little bit on the background of the FieldTrip toolbox. And if you have questions during the lecture, please interrupt, okay? So what are the signals that are generated in the brain? We're, if we're measuring uh, the skull potential or magnetic fields, then we're measuring the activity that is, that is rea related to the postsynaptic potentials in pyramidal neurons. And these postsynaptic potentials in the pyramidal neurons, they represent the excitatory and inhibitory input that these neurons receive. And usually we study these postsynaptic potentials in relation to a presentation of a stimulus or in relation to a cognitive event. Um, the idea is that we have a presynaptic, oh, and I actually point, pointing here doesn't work. Um, so we have a presynaptic um, axon which arrives at the synapse, and of course, at, at the pre, from the presynaptic potential, an action potential is arriving that's causing a small amount of current to flow through the postsynaptic neuron. And that is done by neurotransmitters, and I'm pretty sure that some of you know much more about this than I do. But the idea is that there's a little, about, a little bit of neurotransmitters uh, released in the synaptic clefts, and that causes a postsynaptic potential. It actually causes a little bit of ionic current in the postsynaptic neuron towards the soma or away from the soma, and that's causing the fields that we can record. There are some constraints on what we can see. Um, if you look at action potentials, and action potentials are very short-lived. Uh, so if you have a sharp-tipped electrode, and if you bring it really close to a soma, then you can record an action potential from a, from a neuron. But since most of the recordings that we're doing are not from a small distance, but are really from quite, so quite some distance, we are looking at the summation of many action potentials at the same time. And these action potentials have the characteristics that they have, they're very short-lived and have a, uh, have a depolarization and repolarization. That means if they're not perfectly synchronized, the depolarization and the repolarization, they cancel out at a macroscopic level. So that means with EEG and MEG, we're not really measuring action potentials. We're only measuring the effect that these action potentials have on the postsynaptic neurons, because those effects are long-lived, are uniphasic, so they add up. There's another constraint, and that's that we need, if, if we're looking at many neurons, that these neurons have to be aligned in the same direction. And that's why I'm saying that we're primarily measuring the activity coming from the postsynaptic, uh, sorry, from the from the pyramidal cells, because the pyramidal cells in layer four are nicely aligned, so they have the dendritic trees nicely aligned. So and if we have synchronized input to a lot of these neurons uh, in layer four, and what we get is we get a magnetic field around it. So this is basically high school physics. If we have an uh, electric current running through a wire, um, then we have a magnetic field associated with it. And that's where the right hand rule comes in. So that, and that's really important. Like we're going to use that a lot this week. So if current is running like this, then magnetic field is curving around it like this, right? So that's what you can see. And it's these magnetic fields that we record with MEG. Okay, so we, we can look at this at, at multiple scales. Here on the, on the left, you see a coronal section of cortex. And if you zoom in, uh, then you see that we have, we have the cortex, the, the layer in which uh, all the, uh, like where, in layer four, all the neurons are nicely aligned. And depending on where we 
have the activity, we may or may not see this with MEG. If we have tangential dipoles, for example, the ones in the wall of the sulcus, um, then they produce a magnetic field, or they produce currents that's right like this, They're, so they produce magnetic field which is going like this. <coughs> so that's something that we can see. But at the same time, there's also volume currents. And with a tangential dipole, the majority of the volume currents are actually going deep through the tissue of the head. And that is something that we will look at sli in slightly more detail tomorrow. But the <coughs> important is that it's not only the primary current inside the neuron that is creating magnetic fields, but it's also the secondary current. So if you imagine the primary current running in this direction, magnetic field doing like this, secondary currents are running in that direction, which means that they're producing magnetic fields in the opposite direction. So in general, the primary and secondary currents, they have the tendency to cancel each other out. With the tangential source, since the majority of the secondary current is going far away, they don't cancel out. But if we have a radial source, for example, one in a, in a, in a, in a gyrus, one like on, on the crown of a gyrus, then the primary current produces magnetic fields, secondary currents produce magnetic fields, and those magnetic fields exactly cancel out if we have a radial source in a spherical volume conductor. So that means that regardless of the type of sensors that we're going to use, there is simply no magnetic field outside the head if we have a radial source in a, in a spherical volume conductor. So that means that um, there's quite some constraints or there's quite some things happening in the brain that we're not seeing with MEG. Of course, with EEG, we are seeing this type of activity. We're actually even more sensitive for this type of activity. But for MEG, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that we're simply not seeing. But that's fine. We have the same problem also with, uh, with fMRI, where hemodynamic responses also are, not, are also not ob observable everywhere, and where due to distortions you can also not always record the activity that you want. But just something to be aware of is that MEG is not, is not telling the full story. EG is also not telling the full story. Uh, fMRI is also not telling the full story. Okay, so with EEG we have, um, we are often discussing volume conduction, although I just explained that with MEG, the currents that are running through the volume are also important. But with EEG, the volume conduction is even more important because if we have a generator of a neuronal, uh, so if we have neuronal activity that is generating volume currents, then these volume currents, they have to pass through, through the tissue of the brain, <coughs> the skull, and into the scalp. And it's on a scalp where we have the electrodes where, that we're using to record potential difference. With MEG, because we're, we're measuring the magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields are not, the magnetic fields themselves are not being dis distorted by the presence of the tissue that is in between. So if you have a primary source, primary current running in this way, we have magnetic fields outside the brain like this. But at the same time, we also have the volume currents. So it's the activity that we're recording with the EEG that is also contributing to the MEG. So this is basically like what are the signals uh, that we can pick up. Now the question is like how do we pick up these signals? Um, well, of course, the, the most, like the, the thing that most of you are familiar with is that you put on a cap uh, with electrodes that you attach, in, that you inject a little bit of gel underneath each of the electrodes, that you attach each of the electrodes to a small amplifier in a box, uh, and that you amplify the potential difference between the scalp. Here at the Donners, we're using MEG a lot, and that's also what we will be using in most of the handling sessions. With MEG, we're, we're putting the subject in an MEG scanner. Like, how, how many of you have seen an MEG scanner from close by? Okay, we, we'll, you'll, we'll see one after the, after the coffee break. So with MEG, we're putting the subject in an MEG, in, in, under an MEG scanner, and in principle, we can also record EEG while we're doing MEG. Here at the Donners, we have the tendency not to record EEG, because it makes the experiment longer, because the EEG has, a, has quite some preparation time, whereas the MEG is faster. <coughs> if we would, like, would do combined EEG and MEG, we would be spending a lot of time with the subject preparing, which means that there's less time remaining that the subject is vigilant in doing the task. So here at the Dons, we have the preference for only recording MEG, together with some you know, auxiliary channels, such as the ECG channel and the EOG activity, just to deal with artifacts. 
both with EEG and with MEG, and the analysis can become much more accurate if you do source reconstruction. So here at the Donners, we always get an anatomical MRI scan of our subjects after each MEG experiment. It's also, it, for us it's easy, because the MEG scanner is on that side of the building, and MRI scanner is a little bit further on that side of the building, so we can just tell our subjects to walk down, or we can just schedule them for another day, and we can just get them in, like lying in the MRI scanner for 10 or 15 minutes or so to get an anatomical MRI. <coughs> for people that are working with EG data, it is often not so, like M the MRI scan is often not so accessible. Uh, or you have to pay a lot for it, or it's in a different building, etc. So I know that a lot of people that are doing EEG recordings, they do not have access to anatomical MRIs. But that, that is something that we will be discussing later in the week, like how can you make your analysis the most accurate given the data that you have. But, but by default, I would say this, this, this goes together with getting an MEG scan. Okay, so with MEG, we're measuring magnetic fields, and we're measuring really small magnetic fields. And in order to measure these fields, we're using uh, superconductive quantum interference devices. But these superconductive quantum interference devices, we're not using them by themselves. We're attaching them to a small antenna. And here you can see the effect of such an antenna. So if we have, um, oh, I can't point. Um, we, have a, we have a loop, and the loop is, I think it's one and a half centimeters diameter. And if the magnetic field goes through this loop, then the magnetic field can be transported to the small end of the loop. What we do is we put all of this in liquid helium, which makes this loop, which is made out of niobium, superconductive. And in that case, we have the Meissner effect. The Meissner effect is that if we have a superconductor, then any change in the magnetic field is going to be compensated because of there, because of there not being any resistance. So there's always going to be like an, a current flowing to, put, to keep the magnetic field out because there's no resistance, so the current can like flow like, as easy as it wants. So if there's any change in the magnetic field on this side, or magnetic flux, so field going through this loop, will have a similar sized but opposite change of the flux going through this loop. So that means that with such a flux transformer, like this antenna is called a flux <coughs> transformer, we can basically transport flux from one location to another location. So that gives some opportunities, because that means that we can use a relatively large coil, like a one and a half centimeter coil, and we can attach it to a squid, and a squid is much smaller. So what we do is we put the squid behind the small coil, and what we're now doing is that we're amplifying the magnetic field that we have on this side, because the surface area here is much smaller. So we're basically squeezing all the magnetic field that we pick up here, we're squeezing it through the squid. And the squid is, is basically our magnetic field sensor. So the squid is not something like this, but it's a superconductive quantum interference device. Uh, and it's, it's usually something that's made on a chip. So here you can see a squid, this is from, the, from, Neuro, uh, from Neuromac, or from Electa. Uh, but the idea of a squid is that it's a small loop. And here you can see the loop. And the loop is superconductive, but it has two weak uh, Josephson junctions indicated <coughs> here. And if we pass current through the loop, then the resistance that is sensed by that current is affected by the amount of magnetic field that is going through the loop. So there's a quantum interference, quantum interference effect of the current that is going through the loop at the two Josephson junctions with the magnetic field going through the loop. And that means that if we put a constant current through the squid, and if we record the potential that is needed to keep that current constant, uh, we can detect how much magnetic field is going through the loop. And uh, what we subsequently do is we use a feedback mechanism in which the magnetic field going through the loop is kept constant. And thereby, the magnetic field that's going through the flux transformer can be measured because we know exactly how much feedback we're providing. So this makes MEG um, like a relatively complex setup because all of this has to be done at superconducting temperatures. So everything up to the squid has to be put into a bath of liquid uh, helium. And then we have a whole bunch of electronics, which you will see after the coffee break. Uh, because this whole feedback mechanism, that's, that's where we need <coughs> electronics. So, so with like an, e an EEG amplifier, that's basically, it's a small box. Uh, an MEG system is a whole rack of electronics. Um, 
the reason that we need to that we have to use these types of sophisticated measurement techniques is that the magnetic fields that we're tr trying to record from the human brain are really small. Like they're, they're at the in the order of pico teslas to femto teslas. Whereas the Earth's magnetic fields, so that we're at the order of 10 to the minus 12 tesla. Uh, whereas the Earth's magnetic field is 10 to the minus 5. So that's 10 million times stronger than the magnetic fields emitted by the brain. And if Earth, so at this moment, all your brains are emitting these, these femto tesla fields. But at this time, also here in this room, we have the Earth's magnetic field. So if we want to record uh, brain activity in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, we have to come up with smart strategies for recording it. And of course, if it were only for the Earth's magnetic field, it would actually not be that bad because that's relatively constant. But at the same time, we also have um, computer screens standing close by, other types of equipment. We have cars driving by, we have the MR system, which is actually only 15 meters further, which is like a, a, a three Tesla system, where, whereas we're trying to record 10 to the minus 12 Tesla. So one billion times smaller fields. So that means that if we want to record MEG, we have to not only have a very sensitive sensor, but we also have to have very smart noise suppression techniques. So the sensitive magnetic field detectors, those are the squids. But dealing with the environmental noise has to be done <coughs> using a variety of techniques. So we use shielding, we use sensor design, and then we use reference sensors for noise subtraction. Um, so if you look at, at shielding, so this is, this is the f here on the, on the left, you can see the, the first magnetically shielded room built for uh, human recordings, and it's, it resembles a sphere. Like the ideal magnetically shielded room would be spherical, would have the best noise suppression cancellation. And this was built by David Cohen in, at MIT uh, ar around the time that I was born, like so, so f uh, 45 years ago, 40, 40, 47 years ago. Um, in, in, inside that room, he put a, a one-channel system, and he was able to record MEG activity for the first time, using a, first using a conventional magnetometer and then using a squid-based magnetometer. Nowadays, we're using uh, d different rooms. As you will see after the lunch, we're using square rooms that just <coughs> simply fit into the building more easily. Right? Like they, you just have to f f squeeze them in between the, f the story, uh, like one story of a building. And also, the rooms are a bit bigger to accommodate uh, the chair, the whole head system, but also all the stimulus equipment that we need. So what we have is we have a um, mag magnetically shielded room and that has layers uh, of mu metal, which is a, um, a, a permalloy metal that has a very strong interaction with magnetic fields. Shield, magnetic fields. And it's, so our room has, has three layers. It has two layers of mu metal. It has one layer of aluminium in between. The aluminium has a very good conductivity, and aluminium is really good at making a Faraday cage. So we, what we do is we use the mu metal to shield the low frequencies of the magnetic fields, and we use the aluminium to shield the high frequencies, the high field frequencies of the electromagnetic fields. In, in now, now it, so, the, so these magnetic shield rooms, they've, they've been built for a long time, but they're expensive. Uh, like expensive in the sense that you have all the metal is expensive, um, order of like 500,000 euros, but it, there, it's also heavy, which means that it's difficult to fit such a room into an existing building structure. Like here we were lucky that the, this building <coughs> already existed before the Donda started, but the building had on the ground floor had some really sturdy foundations, like concrete foundations. So we had a nice corner where we could put the scanner without having to make any changes to the, to the building. But you can imagine that if you put a very heavy piece of metal somewhere on the, like on the seventh floor of a hospital building, well, it's going to be challenging. Like it's going to vibrate, it's going to, and it might even like interfere with the structural integrity of the building. So that's why companies uh, such as Electa are now trying to make these rooms lighter so that, that you can more easily install them in clinical settings. So what's happening is that Electa is now moving away from three layer shielded rooms to two layer shielded rooms which saves a lot of weight. And uh, instead of using the compensating effect of the room, they're using noise cancellation coils. So they put large coils around the room, and then using the MEG system, which is placed inside the room, they're not only recording the brain activity, but they're also recording the activity from the environment. 
And if you can record the activity from the environment with the MEG system that you have anyway, you can basically use anti-magnetic fields. So in the same way as, uh, like a lot of you probably will know these, like these headphones that you can use, in, the, at least I always use them in an airplane, uh, where you basically produce anti-sound, you can also produce anti-magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields cancel out the external magnetic fields. Now, that works especially well for the earth magnetic field, or for the slow variations that you have in the earth magnetic fields, but also in cars that are driving by all these relatively slowly changing magnetic fields, which are strong, but which are slow, they can be cancelled out quite well. So this is a really smart strategy, especially if you put it on the outside of the room. The electric system also has noise cancellation coils inside the magnetically shielded room. And the problem is if you put them inside the magnetically shielded room, they're going to produce um, very strong distortions of the magnetic field. So that means that outside the shielded room, you're basically compensating the earth magnetic field, but inside you're basically making a very strange distorted field. Uh, and that means that if you use internal active shielding, you always need to do some post-processing of the data. So if you ever happen to work with collector data, you have to be aware of whether the system that you're using, whether that was using external active shielding and whether it was using internal active shielding. If it's using internal active shielding, you always have to use MUX filter to compensate for the distortions that are inside the magnetically shielded room. So this is about um, shielding, like passive shielding and active shielding. But actually an even more important, or an as important component for dealing with noise in an MEG system is by sensor design. And the sensor that I already showed you is a magnetometer, measures the magnetic field. And what you can imagine is that if you have a current running out of the screen, you have a magnetic field going around it. And if I put my sensor over there, I would have a flux, I would have a, a field going out of the loop, pointing in, in, in that direction. And then depending on where the coil is relative to the source, it's going to record something or it's not going to record something. So with magnetometers, we always have this effect that if you put the magnetometer directly on top of the source, it's not going to see anything. Because the magnetic field lines are basically going in and going out within the side of the, of the coil. And of course, on the other side of the, uh, of the source, the field is pointing in, a in the other direction. So we would have a negative magnetic field. Okay, so magnetic fields are nice, especially if we can distinguish magnetic fields coming from objects which are close by versus objects that are far away. So this is a design of a gradiometer. And a gradiometer measures not the magnetic field, but it measures the gradient in the magnetic field. So here we have two coils. And what you should notice is that the two coils, like a figure of eight type of coil, they have opposite directions. So this coil is going in this direction, whereas this is going in this direction. So if we now put such a coil, sorry, if, if we put such a planar gradiometer at this location, it's going to have a strong magnetic field in this direction, a, a slightly weaker, but since this one is detected in the opposite direction, this one is going to cancel out a little bit of this one. So this is not so sensitive for sources that are far away. But if I put it in an environment where, I, uh, sorry, if, if I put it in an, in an environment where the source is really far away, such as the Earth magnetic fields or a car driving by, then the magnetic field of the environment is going to be equally strong in both coils, and it's, which means that the magnetic, uh, Earth magnetic field is going to be cancelled out. And that's really important, because that means that such a sensor is not sensitive for sources that are far away. And if we put it directly on top of the source of interest, so the directly on top of a source in the brain, then what you can see is that the magnetic fields in both of the coils are going to be of opposite direction, which means that this is the location where the sensor is the most sensitive. There's another design for gradiometers, that which is an actual gradiometer. Here, this is a planar gradiometer. It's, it's recording the gradients in the plane <coughs> in which the coils are. This is an actual gradiometer. It has the same principle, so it also has two coils, but the coils are displaced along the axis of the recording. So rather than like this, it's like this. And this is the design that we have with the CTF MEG system, which we have downstairs here. So with an actual gradiometer system, um, 
for environmental noise, it has the same noise cancelling properties, but in terms of uh, sensitivity profile, it looks more like a magnetometer. And th there's some advantages to the different systems, uh, but it's especially important that if you work with MET data that you know what type of system it is, because the spatial sensitivity is different. So if you look at a magnet magnetometer, a magnetometer has the highest sensitivity, like not directly on top of the source, but slightly offset from the source. That's also where an actual gradiometer has its highest sensitivity, although it's, it's, it's a little bit sharper. But an actual gradiometer and a planar, uh, sorry, an actual gradiometer and a <coughs> magnetometer have a sensitivity profile which is relatively similar. The only big difference is that a actual gradiometer is not so sensitive to environmental noise as an MET meter. And a planar gradiometer has its sensitivity which peaks directly on top of the source. So with um, EEG, it doesn't really matter what, type, what brand of system you have. Like a biosemi amplifier or a brain products amplifier or an EGI amplifier, they all have the same sensitivity profiles and it doesn't really matter. So the, the thing that matters is like, well, where are the electrodes? But with MEG system, it really matters what brand of system you have. Like 4D neuroimaging, or, uh, formerly called BTI, is using magnetometers. CTF is using actual gradiometers, and electroneuromac is using these planar gradiometers. Actually, the electroneuromac system is using a mix of planar gradiometers and magnetometers, has, a little, has the advantage of both. So that, that is really something that's important because that's also something that you, you will have to use in the analysis. Whereas with EEG, you don't have this, uh, this confounding effect of the type of system. And also with MRI, it doesn't really matter whether you have a Siemens or a Philips scanner. It's, it's going to produce the same type of figures. Whereas with, with MEG, it's really different. So it, it's, it's, it's <coughs> difficult to keep track of how many MEG systems there are but I think there's about 150 of them or so in the world. Uh, and we have two, two MEG systems in the Netherlands. Um, MEG is a relatively expensive technique, and the usage of an MEG is, is very narrow. Like an MRI scanner has the advantage that you can use it to study brains, but you can also use it to study knees. Like you can also do all sorts of clinical stuff with an MRI si system. It means that the risk for an institute to get an MRI system is not so large because they can always do something else with it. But an MEG system, well, the only thing that you can put in is like do functional recordings on human subjects. Whereas the an MEG system is more or less the same price as an MRI system, like one and a half million euros or so. So that means that MEG systems are not so common. Of course, that it would be totally impossible to know how many EG systems there are. Like, like ho probably 100,000 or so. So I already mentioned some of the brands of MEG systems. Electroneuromac is currently the one that's selling most systems. I think they also have the largest installed base. And the Electroneuromac system uh, has 306 channels in total. But these 306 channels, they're actually only on 102 different locations. So what they came up with is a sensor design, which you can see over there, where integrated in one chip, there are three channels. There's a... Um, one, that, that's the black one, which is a magnetometer. The magnetometer has a coil which is running all the way around the chip. And then there's the gray one. The gray one is a figure of eight coil that's running like this. And then there's the white one, which is a figure of eight coil that's running like this. So that means that with the electroneuromac system, the chips are relatively large, uh, but they're recording three signals at the same time. And the sensitivity of these three signals is really different. Like the horizontal, and the vertical planar gradient, they're really sensitive for different sources. And that is something that uh, this afternoon in the Hansen session we're also going to deal with, like how, how, to, how to interpret planar gradients. So you can see that there's like the, the magnetometer and then there's the, the two planar gradiometers in there. This is uh, the system like if you just take it apart, and what you can see here are the, are the chips, and here you can see pre-amplifiers uh, that basically uh, uh, amplify the signal before it get, goes outside of the jewel uh, to the, to, to the, to the post-amplification. The relevance for um, 
different types of sensors, and I, why I'm stressing this so much, is really because it has a, it it causes a different sensitivity for the activity that we're interested in. Um, whom of you knows uh, like the N400 response in language research? Quite a few, right? So that yes, yeah, so that's also the like the example that we're going to work with in the handling session. Uh, the N400 is a is a response that you see like it's negative response on the vertex that you see around 400 milliseconds after hearing a word that you did not expect in a sentence. So if you present sentences uh, and you have a critical word, now that critical word you do the experimental manipulation of a critical word that is expected versus a critical word that's not expected, and you can contrast it to then you get an N400. If we look at an N400 response in the MEG, and if we look, if we zoom in on one of these channels over the left temporal cortex, then here you can see the response to uh, an expected word versus the response to a non-expected word. So that's the, N4, the magnetical counterpart for the N400. If we look at it with a, an actual MEG system, like the one that we have here in Nijmegen, then what you see is that you have positive field here, negative field here, and you also see a pattern over here. Whereas if you record the same N400 response with an electroneuromax system, then this is what you see. So the field pattern is really different. And there's, there's one thing that I'm now, that, I, that I'm not showing here, but here I'm actually, I'm showing the combined planar gradient. So what I've done here is that I've combined the, the planar gradient of the horizontal channel and the planar gradient of the vertical channel. I'm taking the absolute planar gradient. So here on this side, you only see positive numbers, whereas on this side, you see positive and negative numbers. <coughs> so here we, have a, here we have a negative field and a positive field, whereas here we have small fields and large fields. No, no negative and positive. And that's because here I'm combining the planar gradient for visualization purposes. So the nice thing is that here you can directly see activity over left temporal area. So there's also a little bit of activity over the right temporal area. Whereas on, on that side, you have to do a little bit more interpretation. So again, if you know the right hand rule, then you know that you could put a dipole here, field going in blue on this side, field coming out red on that side. And there's also a little dipole on the other side of the head. Okay, if you compare this with EEG, well then this is the scalp topography that you get with EEG. It's much more difficult on the base of the EEG to tell where the activity is coming from. You have this vertex negativity, and if you do not have any a priori knowledge, <coughs> it's very difficult to decide that this is coming from templar areas. Right? So that's, that's where a lot of these sophisticated analysis techniques come in. Okay. Uh, yes, and some, some, some people are doing that, um, but uh, so, 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 so sometimes it helps if you can interpolate or if you can use models to interpolate one type of sensor to the other type of sensor. And that, that's what we're going to do this afternoon in the hands-on session, we're, because we have an actual gradiometer system, we're going to use it to compute synthetic planar gradients. So we're going to pretend as if our system is also a planar gradient system. And there's some good reasons for that, which we'll also deal with on Thursday uh, with this in the statistics. Um, but in general, the common level at which we want to interpret our signals is not the level of the sensors, but it's the level of the brain. So actually, I wouldn't really care what type of recording system I have, because what I want to know is I want to know what is the signal in the brain. So I think source reconstruction, that's the way that you would actually move forward in order to come in a common representation. And also in that common representation of, of the brain, that's where EEG and MEG, they're showing the same brain. And that's, I think that, that's where we, where we should be going for. And on uh, Wednesday morning, we'll have a connectivity analysis lecture. And also for in, in that lecture, it's again going to be made clear that connectivity is very difficult to interpret at the center <coughs> level. Whereas, you know, and also we're not really interested in sensor, we're interested in the brain. So if you want to do connectivity analysis, you should be doing it on the brain level as well. So I think the, the common reference frame on which we want to project all our data is that of the brain, not that of a uh, sensor. And that, that, that's both for EEG and for MEG. Okay, something that I wanted to 
Tosiana, this moment is, is this. I, I don't know whether you've seen it. Like about two weeks ago in Nature, this paper came out. Uh, made quite a splash, at least here at the center. Everyone was discussing it. I was like in the evening getting SMS message from the director, like writing, did you see this paper? Can you please explain me? Like, why, do, why don't we have this system yet? Um, <laughs> so I, I told him we should get one because I think it's really cool. But it's, this is actually, um, this is a development which has been going on for at least 15 years or so. I, I'm, I'm more surprised that they made it, that they got it in nature than about the content of the paper per se. But it, it is a really cool technique. So, so this is um, a, an application of magnetoencephalography, which does not require, which does not use squids, and which doesn't require uh, superconductive. superconductive materials. So the idea with an optically pumped magnetometer is that it's, it just uses a very different principle for picking up activity. So what, what it consists of is it consists of a vapor cell. It's basically just a small container that has a vapor in it. And the vapor is either cesium or rubium. And in order to, so cesium is metal. In order to get cesium to, <coughs> as a, in gas form, you have to heat it. So with, with squids, we're cooling it down to, like, my, it was like to, to, four, to four Kelvin, like minus 270 degrees Celsius. This you have to heat up to about 300 degrees Celsius. So what, what, but, uh, but that's actually quite easy because it's small and you can just heat it up and then you have a small isolating uh, thing around it. And then what, what you do is you shine through the gas, through the cesium gas with a probe light that has, polar, uh, that has polarized light. And then the, if you then pump it with another uh, laser, you can get these cesium atoms to have a certain spin in the same way as we use the MRI system to also align the spins in, in, the, in the tissue. So what the cesium atoms, they, their spin is aligned, and that's the spin of the cesium atoms interacts with an external magnetic field. So the amount of light that can shine, the amount of polarized light that is shining through is uh, changed by the uh, external magnetic field. So if you shine in polarized light, it rotates a little bit. So the polarization angle rotates <coughs> a little bit. So what you can do is you can report how much polarization change you have, and that is a measure for the externally applied magnetic field to such a vapor. So here you can see like the applied field, so the external applied field versus the output. And what you can imagine that you want to be like somewhere over here because that's where you're like the most sensitive for having a small change here and a large change in the output. And here you can see like one of the first systems which was using a large cell, so a like a large volume in which there was cesium uh, gas, or actually it was, uh, it was potassium. Uh, and then you see the probe beam uh, and there's a whole bunch of optics. And a nice thing is that all the optics and all the techniques used here, they can be miniaturized quite well. So nowadays people are working with this sensor. This is from a, from a company that uh, I think was founded some three or four years ago. Like it's really a spin-off company from a, from a research institute. And they're commercially producing these sensors. You can, you can just buy one. It's about uh, 10,000 euros. So you, you can buy your own MEG system for 10,000 euros. It's a one-channel MEG system. And what, um, what basically what they, what they did is they, rather than having the laser go through, they use a mirror system to make it more compact. Uh, so the, so the, light, li the light goes in and comes out and then is reflected and goes back. And what the groups in London and Nottingham did is they, they both purchased a bunch of these uh, uh, sensors and they started working with optically printed helmets uh, in which they insert these sensors. So it's not, it's not a whole head system, uh, although in, uh, in Berlin they have been doing recordings with a whole head system using this. They already published, I think, three or four years ago, like 32 channels based according to the 1020 system, so like having a whole head coverage. At this moment, um, the, the Nottingham group is primarily focusing like, on recording activity from a smaller range. Um, but what you can imagine is that if you just that you can slide them in uh, here, and that you have them close close by. So th this is not a practical system yet. And I also think that one aspect that was not really so clear from the paper is that you need to do this in a magnetically shielded environment with requirements and magnetic shielded which are even more strict than the ones that we have nowadays for our system. So 
we have a three-layer identity shield room. The group in Berlin at the Physikalis Technische Bundesanstalt, they have a nine-layer shielded room. Uh, it's really the most magnetic field-free environment on the whole Earth. So that's really like the place where you can do these recordings nicely because they have a, they don't have this <coughs> environmental uh, noise or so this environment of the fields that they have to deal with. In in Nottingham, they have a large MR physics group that can also design coils. So they use internal active shielding to cancel out the magnetic fields of the of the environment so that you can get a, a, a magnetic field free environment the size of the head in which you can do the recordings. And then within that size of the head, you can basically move around a little bit because it's a wearable system. But uh, the whole, if you, if you just imagine like the additional hardware that's needed, it's still uh, something that is very different from an EG recording, which you could basically do in any environment. But like we, you still prefer to do an EG recording in a Faraday cage, in an acoustically silent environment. But in principle, you could, if I could get an EG system, I could do a recording here. So this is not going to be a system as it looks now that's going to be like bedside ready because it needs a magnetically shielded room. Um, but it is going to be a system that is going to be much more, like potentially much more affordable because optical systems are used like in any, like in any cell phone. There's a really good camera inside. That is, that, like, that's where like a lot of companies are investing in optical techniques. Um, glass fiber is basically everywhere. Lasers are everywhere. So this is a technique where, where we can expect that rather than super connectivity, you can have optical techniques, and a lot of companies will be able to make these. So there's going to be a lot of competitions, and we can expect, <coughs> at least I expect, that this is going to be like in 10 years from now, it's going to be a very affordable system with a lot of sensors overall. It's not going to be cheap, but it's affordable compared to nowadays MEG, because it doesn't need the helium. And at this moment, so this morning, our uh, uh, technical staff was again filling our MEG system. They have these large dewar, and they are pouring in 70 liters of helium. Like, and by <laughs> Wednesday, halfway the week, it's evaporated again. And I have to pour it again. Uh, so, so here at the center, we're basically we're pouring 75,000 euros worth of helium in our MEG system every year. And then on top of that, we have a maintenance contract, which is about 100,000 euros, just because the system has to be has to be kept cold, it has to be kept at a vacuum. Uh, all of that stuff is going to disappear with this system. So the running costs of such a system are going to be 150,000, 200,000 euros per year cheaper than the running costs of a normal energy system. And I think that's going to be very relevant. Because at, at this moment, you, we really have to keep the system up and running. We have also have to make sure that the system is constantly being used. Like every day, there's 1,000 euros worth of helium evaporating from the system. So we better make sure that we have two or three recordings every day. Otherwise, yeah, it, it gets you just get the recordings get too expensive. Question: How much does the system cost in its current state? Um, I think the only component that you at this moment can buy are these sensors. I see. Uh, the you, you for three D printing is not that expensive, of course. but it requires a lot of skills. So if you have a, a technical group that knows how to operate a 3D printer, uh, it, it, that knows how to work with 3D designs, you can, you can build such a system by just multiplying it with the number of sensors that you have times 10,000 plus the hours of your technical group. Uh, I think um, the whole, the, like the shimming coil, like the internal, in, internal active shielding, that requires quite some expertise at this moment. But that is expertise which is which is not like not that difficult to get. I think the problems that we're going to have with this system, like in making a, a commercially viable product out of it, is making it into a system. Like this is a, this is a prototype. One of the challenges, if you like, this this is a helmet arrangement. Of course, the ideal arrangement would not be a helmet, because then you have to print a helmet for each of your subjects. Well, it's not much more really practical. We want to have it mounted in a cap, in a flexible cap, as EG electrodes. <coughs> if the si if, if you put these sensors in a cap, of course they have to be a little bit smaller. But then, then the question is also, uh, as we have now with EG, like where are the sensors relative to the head? That's with the, with the current MEG system, it's not a problem because the sensors are fixed and when you use, we use three head localization coils to d determine the position of the three head localization coils relative to the helmet. And since we know the position of the sensors relative to the helmet, well, we know where the head is relative to all the sensors. 
but here you would have to determine for each channel separately its position and its orientation. Because obviously if you put them in a cap, they're going to tilt a little bit. Um, so, that th so those are practical <coughs> issues that definitely have to be dealt with in terms of engineering, making a system that's going to be u as user-friendly as our MEG system that we have nowadays. I think that's going to be one of the bigger challenges for the next few years, like to how to, s to solve the engineering problems and to miniaturize it, make the system cheaper, like we should all buy the system, because if, if more people buy it, it's going to get cheaper. Um, but I think it's it has really uh, it has qu quite some potential in MEG being more widespread than it is now, because of the costs. The whole cost structure is definitely going to change. Also, for specific uh, populations, especially children, this is going to be a, a big change. Because with the MEG system that we're using now, we have a fixed helmet. And if you put a, a child's head in the helmet, there's a lot of space in between the helmet and the, and the head. Um, which means that for children, and especially for babies, like the smaller they get, the more mm. difficult it actually is to use MEG to report brain activity. With this system, you can adjust the sensors such that they're always in a scalp. Which means that regardless of the head's shape and head size, you can get nice sharp act, uh, measurements of the activity. So I think that that's also going to be really, really nice. Okay, so this is more or less like the, the, the type of signals uh, that we're recording and the, the different types of recording system. Oh yeah, perhaps one thing that I should say here. I, I mentioned you. Uh, I mentioned about the the the, the planar gradients and then, uh, actual gradients as a way of noise suppression. The reason that this system needs such a heavily shielded, uh, shielded room is that with, you, with this system you cannot make gradients. You can, you can record a signal at two locations, but you, you cannot make an antenna with this system. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a relevant point is that um, uh, that these types of wire wound constructions they're possible because ni niobium <coughs> is superconductive, and with niobium we can make arbitrary shapes. So it means <coughs> with niobium, when it was superconductive, we can make antennas, flux transformers, of an arbitrary shape, and then thereby we can tune our sensitivity or insensitivity to environmental fields. As soon as we're moving away from superconductivity, we don't have these antennas anymore. So that's one of the reasons that the OPM system is going to be requiring a heavily shielded room also in the future. And hopefully someone will come up with a trick to make a gradient gradiometer out of an OPM system. But at this moment I don't see I don't see that option yet. Okay, so what I now want to do is I want to move on like that. how do we analyze these types of signals in a field trip? Um, so the types of signal characteristics that we consider during the analysis are of course like the time course, uh, and, and we can look at event related potentials. Uh, we can look at the spectral characteristics using the power spectrum, or we can look at how the power spectrum is changing over time using time frequency responses. And we can look at the spatial distribution of, of the activity over the head, and that's where source reconstruction comes in. And these two different aspects, they really require a different type of modeling. That, that's also what we will be dealing with in the next few days. Um, let, let's first look at the temporal characteristics. So if we think of, of, an, uh, of a cognitive experiment, what we often do is we present a stimulus. Uh, and then we expect the brain to respond to that, to that stimulus. What we can do is we can re repeat the same stimulus many times, so we get many trials. And if we assume that the brain is re responding to that stimulus on every trial in the same way, then we can average the activity and we get our average evaluated potential. And a nice thing is that if there's also spontaneous activity or background noise, which is not correlated uh, over the trials, then by averaging, we're removing or reducing the effect of the, of the background activity and we still have our averaged generated potential. Not all the cortical activity is nicely face locked. So here we have a stimulus or an event, and the event is causing time locked activity but the phase at which the time-locked activity happens changes from one trial to another trial. So one trial, the activity starts with an upgoing flank, and another trial, the activity starts with a downgoing flank. And if you average this, you're not going to see an average, uh, you're not going to see an event like the potential. And for this, we need frequency and especially time frequency analysis methods. 
The other aspect that we look like is, is the spatial aspect. And for, th for that, it's really important to understand superposition of source activity. So if we have a source, for example, in occipital cortex, and if we have another source in more frontal areas, then on the channel that is in between, we're going to see a linear mixture of these two sources. And it, it's really important that it's a linear mixture. But that's something that we're exploiting through a lot of the analysis strategies that we're using. And, it's, it's, and we know that we can model this as linear because Maxwell equa equations tell us that in the absence of capacitive effects, we can use a purely resistive model. And if it's resistive, then we have a linear model. If we have channels like more clo close to the, to the back of the head, we'll primarily see the activity from the occipital source and channels at the front are more seeing the frontal source. Um, so what we do is if we want to separate the activity of the sources, we can use a variety of techniques. On the one hand, we can use at the temporal aspect of the source. So we can look at, uh, at event-related fields or event-related potentials. We can look at the latencies. We can look at event-related potential difference waves. We can look at filters. We can, use, uh, we can, we can apply filters. And the filters are especially used if we want to distinguish brain activity from non-brain activity. Um, and we, we can use spectral decomposition. But we could also use the spatial aspects of the data. And then we're using a volume conduction model of the head. And we're modeling uh, the source parameters using, using, using dipole models. So this is just like the, the general idea of the analysis strategies that we're going to cover in the next few days. So if you look at how we analyze these signals in FieldTube, well, FieldTube is, of course, it's a, it's a toolbox. It, ha it has tools in it. It does not have a graphical user interface. And the idea is that you're going to use these tools to make an analysis pipeline. The tools in FieldTube are functions. And <coughs> the functions look like this. So a, a MATLAB function has a, <coughs> has a function name. And in FieldTrip, we have chosen to make all these functions behave similar so that they first have an input structure, which is a configuration structure. And in the configuration structure, we tell the function how it should behave. And functions can also have input data, and a lot of functions will also produce output data. <coughs> Some functions produce figures, so they don't produce data. <coughs> Some functions are related to reading or to simulating data, so they do not, do not take any input data. But in all cases, the configuration is there, and it's a structure where we try to specify where we specify how the function should behave, how the algorithm implemented in the function should behave. <coughs> and the way that we specify this is by making the human readable. So we always specify channels using a cell array of strings rather than a bunch of numbers that indicate the channel numbers. If we would specify channel numbers, that gets very confusing once you start rejecting channels because you have a bad channel. Because then all of a sudden, all the channels shift by one. So what we try to do with FieldTrip is that we try to keep the bookkeeping part of FieldTrip so that you don't have to worry about it. And also the same with frequency of interest limits. We, we specify them in hertz. We specify time in seconds um, so that you don't have to think about sampling rates and that, those type of things. If, if you compare this to standard MATLAB, then within FieldTube we have a configuration that has a certain key and a certain value. So it has an option and the option has a value. And the more complex MATLAB functions, and that's something that you especially encounter with the plotting functions, they're also using the same strategy, but they're, they're putting the keys and the values like together in the function call. So, so this works as well, and, and in future we're using this for the low-level function, not for the high-level function. The advantage of doing it like this is that you have your options on separate lines, which means that you're going to make a script, which if you read it from the top to the bottom, you can actually see what's happening. Whereas here, if you have a lot of options, so if you have an algorithm that has a lot of options, you get a very long line, which makes it very difficult to read. And also, if you want to change this part of the line, you, you cannot quickly comment it out because then the remainder of the line could also be commented out. So in the style of the scripts that you would write would look very different if you would have this style versus this style. So that's the reason why we chose to use configuration structures. In FieldTrip, we use these functions of the toolbox and analysis protocol. So you could start with pre-processing, reject artifact, frag analysis, etc. Each of these functions has its own help. And each of these functions also has its own configuration. So what you can do is you can type help FT preprocessing, you would get a, a short description like this. 
And what you then do is you basically make a script in which you combine small pieces of code, each piece of code related to one of the steps that you're doing the analysis. So this would be the first piece of code where I'm doing FT preprocessing. Then I will be doing FT frac analysis. And something that I want to point out is that each of these functions has a configuration structure, but the configuration structure is unique to each of the functions. So the settings that you use in FT preprocessing, FT frac analysis doesn't understand them. So that's why best practice is always to start with an empty configuration, like just to make sure that you don't have any settings from your previous function call, because that might confuse the interpreter. Okay, so besides you making a script, there's also data structures. And in FieldTrip, we have a, a number of standard data structures. So this is a data structure for raw data. And what you can see is that there's a label field, so this is for 151 channels. There's a trial field and there's a time field. And trial and time are both cell arrays with 80 cells. Each cell is a matrix. But in FieldTrip, we allow for trials that have a variable trial length. So we cannot stack them in a three-dimensional array, as for example is done in EEG lab. But we can basically have one trial that has this long and another trial that's this long. And each trial is a, is a matrix. But we are assuming that all the trials have the same number of channels. Sampling frequency is specified. Here you see the header of the file that from which the data was read, and, and you see this configuration. I'll, I'll get back to that. If you now look at time locked data, so that's data that has been averaged over trials. It again has a, has a label field, but now it has an average. And in the average, you can recognize 151 by 900, 151 are the channel labels, and the 900 are the 900 time points. And there's also a variance field. What you also see is that we have this dim ord. And this dim ord describes the dimension order, so it's channels by time, of the fields that are relevant in this data structure. <coughs> and here you would say, well, that's pretty obvious. But once the data structures get more complex, this dim ord helps us with the bookkeeping. Because you might, at a certain point, you might have channels by channels by trials. So then we'd have 151 by 151 by, I don't know how many trials, oh yeah, by 80. Or we would have repetitions by frequencies by time, repetitions by tapers by frequency by time. And at that moment, these, with, these, with these three and four dimensional data structures, it, it can become difficult to determine what is what. That's what this dim ord helps. Okay, so the idea is that in using the field toolbox, you basically glue together a whole bunch of small pieces of codes, uh, and then you run them, and then you want to keep track of your, uh, of your analysis. So the, in the input configuration that you specify to a field function specifies the parameters that you want to use of the algorithm. But as you've seen, the structures, the data structures that are produced by field they also have an output configuration. And in the output configuration, we keep the history so if we have this configuration, this contains what you want to what you want the function to do, and data out contains the structure with, of course, the data that you want to compute, but it also contains data out of the CFG. That's this CFG. So it means that if you have done a computation, you can look at the result of the computation to figure out where did this data come from. And actually, data out of CFG also contains previous. So that all means that on the basis of output data, you can see where the data came from. And of course, this one, again, contains CFG. So it means that at any step of the analysis, you can always trace back what you've been doing to get there. So the details of the computations are kept with the data. The previous data is not kept by FieldTrip. Like FieldTrip doesn't have an overarching data structure, such as EG Lab has. Uh, you, ha you have to manage your own data. You have to decide which of the data structures you're going to save to disk and which you're going to discard. But the important thing is that the previous data is not kept by future, but if you have a data structure, you can always see where it came from. And it means that at a certain point in your, in your analysis, you can use this function, FT, um, FT analysis pipeline, to make an analysis, to, to show the analysis pipeline. So here you can see at the end, FT time lock statistics, which is based on two times FT time lock analysis, FT preprocessing, and a whole bunch of steps, and you can basically trace back all the details of your computation. 
And th this is also the way that you should conceptually think of your analysis, that you should think of it in steps, rather than think of it in it as a script. So you, you will be writing scripts, but you should try to um, abstract away a little bit from the script to the idea of that, you, that you're doing steps on your data. That's, that's how, this is one of the ways that we visualize these steps. So the way that we use field trip in scripts is that we would start with FT preprocessing, then we would write a piece of code that pertains to frac analysis and frac statistics, and we could move on with topo plotting or with some other branch. And of course, once we've done that for a single subject, well, and we want to do this for a whole bunch of subjects. So that's, that's where we take the code, and then we start adding for loops around it. So for each of my subjects, for each of my experimental conditions, I can do FT preprocessing, I can do FT frac analysis, but now it becomes relevant to look at what the characteristics of the data are. Because what I'm doing here is I'm keeping all my data in memory. And if this is an MEG experiment, well, then one recording can easily be uh, like a few gigabytes. If I read that into memory, I'm pretty sure that like after two or three subjects, MATLAB is going to complain that it, that it doesn't have any, enough memory anymore. Whereas if it's an EG recording, like 32 channels, not too high sampling rates, this would easily fit. So the type of analysis um, scripts that I would be writing, they depend on the programming, sorry, they depend on, the, on the, the, the features of the data. So what we often do is that we store intermediate data to disk, especially for the larger analysis. And it, this is, for example, how you, would, how you would do it, and then the next morning you would come back and all the data would be stored, you would find all the data on your disk. You could make this actually even more sophisticated. Like here at the Donut, we have a compute cluster, and uh, either using BFEVAL, which is a MATLAB version of distributed FEVAL, and FEVAL is a function evaluation. What we can do is we can say that we want to evaluate the function FT preprocessing on all of these configurations. So what I'm basically doing is in here, I'm first telling like all of the possible configurations, and then I'm executing everything in parallel. That's really cool because then you don't have to wait the whole night for your computation to finish. Um, and, and here I'm first doing FT preprocessing and FT frac analysis. So, th so this is using the MATLAB uh, distributed computing toolbox. Um, since we don't have the MATLAB distributed computing toolbox here at the Donners, we have an alternative which is called QSUP cell phone. So it's evalu it's, it works in the same way, but it's just using a different, a slightly different strategy. And again, the nice thing is that it, it runs everything in parallel. So field trip is a toolbox, and the data and the separate functions of the toolbox are in your hands. Uh, you're going to write scripts, and your scripts, they depend on the properties of your data on your computer, <coughs> uh, depending on whether you have a lot of memory or not, uh, depending on whether you want to um, <coughs> like want to run things during the night, or whether you want to have like more interaction with the data. Um, but also on your programming skills and programming style, you would write a different script. So as such, there's, no, there's not a single way of a correct script. There's, there's many different ways. But the idea of an analysis pipeline always is the same. So scripts, they correspond to analysis protocols or analysis pipelines. And the idea is that you can have your script reviewed by your supervisors. Okay, you can just go to your supervisor and you can say, well, this is what I've been doing. And then you can basically read it. Uh, you can also share your scripts with colleagues. Or you can publish your scripts along with your, uh, with your publication. That, that is something that we will be discussing on Thursday as well. In, in designing your scripts, you should always think that uh, we try to make this one-to-one -one mapping between analysis steps and toolbox functions. Um, so here you can see, like, field trip functions on this side and conceptual steps on this side. So we will always start with, with selecting pieces of data following stimulation and we detect and remove artifacts, we filter noise from data. And for each of these, we have a, a field trip function. That's how we try to, try to chunk the codes in, in logical chunks. And if you zoom out a little bit, then here you see an overview of the main functions. <coughs> Back actually was in 2007. Uh, nowadays, field trip has grown a lot. So we have a lot of functions. We have more than 100 functions. So that means that it can be a little bit difficult to find your way in field trip. Because like, not, not all functions can be combined with each other. Uh, so here you can basically see that like, if you start with defined trial and then pre-processing, then you can go either into the frequency analysis part or in the time lock analysis part. And then both can be continued with source analysis. <coughs> but nowadays, we have so many 
choices that you can make in your analysis that it's sometimes going to be a bit challenging. So that's why it's important that you know how to find your way around in a toolbox. Okay, so in MATLAB we have uh, yeah, field trips open source, so you can look at all the code. So you can always type help function name. Uh, but what I often do myself is I just type edit function name. Then, then I don't only see the help, but I can actually also see the code. Sometimes there's some additional documentation, some background information that you can see from the code. So that's why it's useful to open a field trip function in the editor. Of course, we have uh, the field trip website where we have a lot of tutorials that we'll be using this week. Uh, we have the email discussion list where users of field trip are helping each other. And we and, uh, and I think it's also really important to like to be aware of the expertise in your local group. So also this week, uh, like you will all be working like on, on computers. So the f if if you don't understand something, the first person to ask is the person sitting next to you, because he might he might already be able to solve it for you. And that's like that's usually that's the, that's the quickest. And I, I know like everyone will be eager to ask me a question, but I, there's only one me, uh, so that doesn't scale well. So it, it's really important to identify like who is who is the expertise that is most easily accessible to you. So here within the Donners we have the MAG meeting, which is like a weekly meeting uh, where we gather and discuss uh, questions. But I also know that in each of the PI groups here at the Donners, there are some people, usually postdocs or sometimes the senior researchers that have more experience than the more junior PhD students. And those are usually the ones that are like the best approachable because they know they already know the experimental research question, they know the, the paradigm, um, they, they also know the person, so they know what kind of programming skills that person has. And which, which basically means that sometimes you have to give um, a, a relatively simple answer, and sometimes you can go into the details, depending on what, what skills someone has. So the expertise in your local group, that's important <coughs> to know. And I also hope that you will all be bringing expertise back home to your own local groups back home, and that you will be sharing that. Okay. I would like to wrap up with a little bit of background on the field trip toolbox. Um, so, the audience of the field trip toolbox is primarily to experimental neuroscientists. But since field trip does not have a graphical user interface, it's we were aiming it at the more dedicated and the more ambitious researchers. Um, field trip is not something that you learn in one afternoon. Uh, it, so it, I, I would. I'm also still a little bit hesitant, like whether we should use field trip in training our bachelor students and our master students, because I think that they will actually learn better on the EG if they have a graphical program in front of them. This is something where, like, if you if you're going to do a full EG or MEG study and you're going to spend a year with the data, then I think it's worthwhile investing in it. And the first month might might be frustrating, but then you get the hang of it, and all of a sudden everything becomes much more clear, and also much more. Uh, sophisticated, like all the stuff that you cannot do with the graphical user interface, you can do with, with FutureTrip. And on the other hand, the, the audience of FutureTrip as a toolbox is also the developers of, the, of other software packages. We're work, working together a lot with, with SPM and with EG App. We're actually also working together with, with companies such as Visa. Like Visa is implementing a lot of the techniques that we have implemented in FutureTrip. Visa is copying them <coughs> and making them available with a graphical user interface to an audience that we cannot support. I think that's really good. And it's, I think it's also fair that they're asking money for it because they basically have staff that they have to pay. This field trip is a research toolbox, uh, but it's also good that uh, it might also be relevant for you if you have a commercial tool with which you can get your research done. I think that's perfectly fine. So my preference is to develop open source. But I think there is a, also a place for closed source and for commercial software. And, and also very important is that we are targeting developers of other analysis tools and methods. And those are usually the more low-level methods that experimental neuroscientists will not be able to get to by themselves. Such as Symbio, which is a finite element modeling toolbox, partially written in Fortran, partially written in C++. I think that's going to be challenging for you to compile that. But FieldTrip has an interface to it. And OpenMAG is also one of these toolboxes. So if you look at FieldTrip from a from some perspective, then there's a we have a, we have the field trip main functions, and those are the functions that start with the CFG as the first input argument. They have low level functions. Um, so the end user's perspective, so your perspective during this week, is primarily on the main functions. But if you look in more detail at these low level functions, uh, which I 
I, I recommend that you do, you will see that these low-level functions, they're organized in separate sub-toolboxes. So we have a toolbox for file, uh, file importing and exporting, for forward modeling, for pre-processing, for multivariate analysis, for distributed computing. Um, and over here, you can find the ft underscore something functions, which take a config as the first input argument. Whereas down here, we often use, uh, we, so we still use ft underscore something, but we often use multiple names. So the function names are typically a bit longer, a little bit more detailed. But more important is that over here, we're not using the CFG anymore. So here we're using key value pairs. So sometimes it is necessary that you use these functions, especially ft read date and ft read event. Uh, those are sometimes handy. But in general, we, we advise to use the high level interface. So to summarize, um, I've been like explaining the type of signals that we're able to record from the brain. I've explained how we record these signals. I've gone over the different types of MEG systems, the different types of sensitivities that MEG channels have, like with magnetometers, planar gradiometers, with actual gradiometers. I also touched upon OPMs, which I expect that we'll be seeing a lot more from in the next 10 years. Uh, I haven't really explained a lot about EEG, but my expectation is that you all know pretty much what EEG is. You just apply electrodes and you attach it to the amplifier and basically it on. But if you want to know more about EEG, that's also something we can discuss over the coffee or during the lab demo, something like that. Because there's always stuff uh, also with EEG that is not totally trivial, like referencing ground electrodes, like what's the difference between them. Um, so we, we, can, we can discuss that like one on one. Um, I've explained to you how to analyze, uh, I've given you an overview of how to analyze these things with future, because that's what we'll be doing a lot during this week. And I've given you a little bit of background on the future project. Um, so we now have a coffee break scheduled. Uh, and after the coffee break, we're going to have a lab demonstration um, in which we're going to split the, the group, basically the, the, the group as a, at large into two groups. And we have uh, around like close to 40 participants. I think 10 of them are from the donors. So I think we should have about 15 people in each of the labs. And that, that, should, that should just fit. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to meet with the people that are going to the lab demo downstairs at the coffee room and then we'll split, okay? And then after the lab demo, we uh, have, have lunch, which is also downstairs. And after lunch, we're going to reconvene here and we're going to do the first hands-on session. And then we'll just see how it goes, yeah? Okay, so let's have coffee. <coughs> Yeah.